Great. Hello, everybody. I'm back. <laughs> um, so next time we ask questions, I want to see all these hands go up. We've broken the ice. So I'm going to call right on you, you know, or right on you. So be, be prepared. Uh, it's good to be with all of you. Nice to see you. Colby, you're my favorite right now. I mean, I like everybody on stage, but we didn't meet last night. He raises how many? 40, 40 or so uh, we pigs? Have, yeah. Well, We're going to have a guy here. here on later who's that got 10,000. And some, my, my friend from uh, Houston may have more, but, but uh, you, you grow 40 and your kids grow fond of the baby oh, yeah. pigs. Yeah. yeah. They're, 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 yeah. They can turn into pets if you're not careful. Yeah. And, and they do in your family, right? Yeah. And you were telling me that the pigs have personalities and. Yeah, they're basically, um, we have a, a show pig operation, which we we grow pigs for not only our kids, but then for kids from um, in 4-H and FFA projects. So if you go to a state fair, county fair around this region, you're going to see pigs that we raise. And at that six-month period, the kids can deal with it when they're yeah, pigs are like some of them Yeah, some of them get sold for uh, for, for breeding gilts, though, so they keep them and take them home and, and start their own projects. But for the most part, yeah, they're market animals that... Uh, serve a purpose. Well, Christine, you work at Tyson across so many different sectors. You were sharing with me last night, you have all four. Yes. So we want to walk us through that. Yes. So Tyson Foods, we have chicken, beef, pork, and turkey. And we also, in my team, we are also in charge of sustainability. So all things sustainable as well. And innovation. So Tyson Foods has a program called Sustainable Food Production, mm -hmm. where we've looked at those three facets together because they are all interrelated. And what would you say, given that you've looked at all of these realms, when you look at the broad agenda that we're talking about today, which is how to get um, the tracks right, where we're both having responsible and sustainable food production, but we're not undermining the health of people in this country, what's the most problematic of the four? Well, as you heard before, antibiotic resistance is a global concern, and we have to work collaboratively together to address this issue. So what we've done in our broiler chickens is we've committed to, by 2017, removing those antibiotics from that production that are important for human health. And during that process, we're going to be transparent. We've also heard transparency is a key factor. That message is loud and clear, and we're going to do our part. So surprisingly, today out is our sustainability report for 2015. Mm -hmm. And the first section is our animal well-being. So as we indicated, we are reporting our usage for our broiler chickens today. So check it out. Great. And Colby, you know, just in, in terms of the size difference, you know, given the, the scale of what you do, I mean, you're, you're out there, but you also, I know, lobby a, a bit of this in the state of Maryland to try to get good practices in place. What are the biggest concerns you have about the regulatory environments that are developing? Well, I mean, we don't have, we only got 20 minutes, so, but I'll try to, <laughs> I'll try to get to, to the and you got other panelists here. Yeah, yeah. so, uh, you know, really when it comes down to it, and, and, and we talked offline a little bit about some things too, is, you know, you almost have to be careful what you wish for in, in society because, unfortunately, we could start moving away from animal agriculture being grown in this country and then start to have it grown in other countries. And we're already starting to see um, food chains and things like that starting to source from outside the country for different products and things. And so, um, you know, USDA and FDA and CDC and all the programs that we have in place to try to ensure food quality is the best in this country. And if you go across the country, you talk to a lot of people, they'll tell you that um, American-made products, American-made food are, is grade A. You know, that's the top end. And so I'm a little, I'm, I'm really worried about that, that, you know, we, we get into our blinders and we really focus on single source. And then all of a sudden we kind of forget the whole forest here, which is a food security issue and making sure that We've already started this plant once before. We already seen the plan when we when we started to source all of our oil from foreign countries. Then we had four dollar gas, and then all of a sudden we started to rain, rain that back in. Um, we can start riding bicycles, and we can use mass transit. Not today, but we can use mass <laughs> transit most of the places um, to to combat four dollar oil. But we can't can, we cannot combat not having food security. So that's very, very important to me. And Susan, you're, you, in Keep Antibiotics Working, I know I, I read up on some material that you contend that 70% of antibiotics in the United States are used for non-therapeutic purposes. So <coughs> what, we're, we're all here on stage. We're all friendly. You can all talk to each other. What do you think this industry is not doing that you want them to do? 
Well, I think they are making strides. I think the changes that are they FDA, big strides or little strides? Uh, they're a big step. More needs to be done. I don't mm -hmm. think they go as far as they should, but they are big steps. Um, and so I would applaud uh, Tyson for their transparency. I would applaud um, FDA for the transparency that they have with the regulations and with the guidances that have come out. Um, I think that will really help. Um, transparency drives consumer trust, so it's in the best. Um, you know, it's good for business um, to be transparent. So the more data we have and the more we understand how antibiotics are being used, mm -hmm. um, the better we can address um, issues that can drive resistance. But and if so, we put you in charge, what else would you do? Um, I think one of the biggest things is prevention. And so non-routine prevention uses, I think, um, are... Tell me what that means. So um, what's... And I think Bill um, Flynn talked about it a little bit with FDA. Um, growth promotion uses are considered an injudicious use by the Food and Drug Administration. Mm -hmm. um, and that is because it, it's a selective pressure that you put on, um, you know, any bacteria that is in the gut of the animal. And it can allow those that have a resistance gene to proliferate and to um, be the bugs that are in that animal's gut. Similarly, um, if you use an antibiotic for preventative use routinely without sort of the oversight and without the understanding of what disease is actually there, um, a lot of it, about two-thirds, I think, are, could be overlap with what we can currently have as growth promotion uses. Mm. So when you're using a drug in the so same a dose, animal is same dose, same duration, animal. yeah, same dose, yeah. same duration, but called prevention, um, can, can be an issue. And so I think that getting rid of prevention uses that are inappropriate is very important, but that requires data. It requires transparency. It requires um, veterinarian <coughs> transparency. It requires um, knowing more about VFDs, um, mm -hmm. trying to get some of the data from the, the feed mills and others that are, that are still using um, antibiotics for prevention uses. Can I put that in yeah, the farmer? Sure, go ahead, yeah. Yeah, uh, that, that's, a, that's the argument that we hear, that we've been hearing for the last, and I, I really believe that's the the whole premise behind the FDA guidance 209 and 213. Um, currently, and it was brought up in the last panel, I heard, I heard the, the one woman say that, you know, the use of antibiotics can be bought over the counter. Right. Um, kind of in, in, the, in layman's terms. And that's technically true and technically not. The ones that can be bought over the counter are feed grade. Mm -hmm. And so if I want to put it in my feed or I want to buy a feed with an antibiotic in it, I can go to the, grocery, I can go to the farm store right now and buy a bag of baby pig starter. I can buy 10 bags of baby pig starter. I can buy 100 bags of baby pig starter if they have it in place. And I can feed it for the 21 days. I can feed it all the way for six months. That's the current policy that's in place right now. Starting on January 1, 2017, that is eliminated. So that over-the-counter use is gone. Mm -hmm. So me as a small farmer, I'm not going to be able to do this, um, disease, this what, I call, what I call routine disease prevention is... I'm going to feed it today, and if it's working today, it'll work tomorrow, and it'll work the next day, and it'll work the next day. And so I might as well just continue to feed it so I don't have a chance. That, to me, is routine disease prevention. Hmm. Disease prevention that we're going to is the veterinarian sitting there saying, hey, I'm going to prescribe you this. You're going to use it for 21 days. I'm only going to allow you to have so much so it can't go farther than 21 hmm. days, and then you're off. And then if you still have a problem, then you call me well, up. Can I'll you come live out with check. that? It's going to be tough for a small guy because mm. I'm the, the large, the larger scale operations. They already have that veterinarian client relationship that says uh, I'm an integrator, and the veterinarian comes out and he or she is saying, "Okay, this can only be used for this purpose. You're having you're having mortality rates. Let's address the problem." As a small producer, my veterinarian client relationship, quite frankly, is a lot of I need a, I have to have a surgical procedure done or or I need health papers done or things like that, my veterinarian doesn't come out to my, to my place as much because I can get mine over the counter. That is going to totally change. So now my veterinarian is going to be my best friend because I only use medically important antibiotics for a very short period of time. I use them from when they're about two weeks old to mm. about four to five weeks old. So when they go through that weaning stage and they're, they're very susceptible to E. coli and Campylobacter and Salmonella and they're getting changed from this, this environment to this one, because I'm small scale, I can't put them, I can't, you know, the weather out today is a prime example. 
and I use it for a very, very short window, and I'm going to have to have a VFD to mm. get that short window drug. And that's we, ha- we, have a, we have a veterinarian. We have a great veterinarian here. I'm sure she's willing to be a great friend of your farm. I was just going to say, uh, I'm happy uh, to be Kobe's best friend. <laughs> in, your, in your world in which you do this, you know, one of the things we've talked about, we talked about last night, and, and, and you were a, a quite eloquent defender of the veterinary backbone that we're moving into, and I'd love you to share a little bit of that about that. But it does make me think that the workload of veterinarians is about to go through the roof. Do we have enough veterinarians? Um, that's an interesting question because there is this perception that there's a shortage of veterinarians and what we like to call it is the maldistribution of veterinarians because I'm sure you're aware veterinarians have different areas of practice and certainly in certain geographical areas there are not as many veterinarians that are needed so we do foresee um, some concerns moving forward having this veterinary oversight. Has there been any analysis of that as we shift on January 1, 2017 into this new regime that there's going to be Just enough capacity, enough load? There hasn't been any official analysis of it that I'm aware of. We have, for a number of years, been looking at the maldistribution of veterinarians in general across the country, looking at areas where um, there's higher concentrations of animals relative to the veterinarians in those particular areas. So we do have um, a number of initiatives to address that, but not particularly related to the VFD or that transition. from. Can you talk to me? You're a health professional, and, and, and I am interested in this question that came up earlier about linkage and whether uh, better practice or different practices in animal husbandry ought to lead to different health outcomes for people. I mean, because that's essentially what's driving this, right? And so what is your sense of that question? Is it a fair question? I think it's a certainly, it's definitely a fair question. And in my mind, I wonder, how are we going to answer that question? Because I look at the literature that's out there, and what you see are findings that suggest that there is, is a linkage. You don't see very many studies that say, hey, we found nothing. So in my mind, a lot of the publication bias becomes a societal bias. Nobody really wants to fund a study that says, hey, well, I didn't find anything. You know, nothing, you know, I don't expect to find anything. Nothing is occurring here. But people do want to see studies that say, hey, this could happen, and it's very dangerous. Those are things that people pay attention to and make people take action. So I'm wondering, you know, how much of the information is out there is, um, is really solid scientific evidence, and how much of it is um, what we call primary research, as opposed to people kind of looking at other data and, and coming to conclusions from it. And in my review of the data, I've found that there's very little primary research that would support that, and, and even less primary research that doesn't support it. So, <clears throat> Christine, you, you, your company just recently announced this no antibiotics forever line of pork, is that right? Mm-hmm. And um, called Open Prairie Natural Pork, as my researchers have given this to me. So what happens, I mean, how how do you get in that line? Do your your animals get sick? So this is the sick food kind of line, you know, or, uh, 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 you know, just, and and I'm sort of interested because last night we had a dinner with some of us, many of you may know Nora Poyan uh, of Nora, restaurant Nora. So she has one of the first, she has the first certified organic restaurant in the United States and we were talking about this, the difference between, I mean, it's a sort of a romantic notion of, you know, free roaming pigs that never had uh, antibiotics. So is that what you're doing? You're creating the Nora Poyo online? Um, we have a lot of choices. Mm-hmm. We have a lot of products and a lot of choices for consumers. And some consumers... What would you serve at home? What would I would serve? Regular Tyson pork mm-hmm. that is in the package uh, because I've got two boys uh-huh. and my grocery bill is pretty darn expensive. <laughs> so um, that's what I serve. But there are other choices for folks and that we respect that. Um, and so not only do we have the pork option, we have a cattle option and we have a, a chicken option as well. Mm-hmm. Um, but that does not mean that one is better than the other. It's choices and those consumers can decide which particular choice they want. As to the growing practices, they have to be treated differently. Um, If those animals do get sick, they are treated, but they're not placed in that supply chain. I see. Because, and Colby, I'll turn it to you and Christine, um, that's one of the tensions. Even though people may say, I want no antibiotics used whatsoever, but there will come a time that bad things happen to good animals. And we, like the rest of us on the panel, 
have a moral and ethical duty to treat those animals. You would not want to not treat a member of your family. So we will treat them. And as we talked about, transparency is important. So now we need to disclose this percentage of animals were treated. And we continue to work with partners for new tools to, so that we don't have to use those really so critical you, you, you represent a huge industry. As you look at other of your rivals of the same scale, what do you think they're not doing that they should be doing? Because it sounds like you've got a pretty good model, but I want you to critique your competitors. Well, I can say only about Tyson. Um, I think that we... I try. We, yeah. <laughs> we, we are in this collectively. Um, I think it really is a collaborative approach. Um, we've got the medical professionals here. We have researchers. We have action groups. We have farmers. As you heard in the last panel, if we do not work together, we will not succeed. And I think we have to get away from he said, she said, their fault, my fault, because it is a global concern and we're all in this boat together and we all have to pull on the oars together. And I'm going to turn it to Colby or Christina. Colby, have you tried to, to raise pigs with that antibiotics? Yeah, unfortunately, I tried it uh, a couple of years ago, and, and it was it was strictly we have our show pig side, as I right. told you, and then I always have feeder pigs. So, I mean, just because I'm I, I'm definitely want to come. You're in Maryland, okay. so I want to come see your farm. <laughs> but but what's a tell us about a show pig line? I mean, I just don't. Okay. I mean, I'm so, pretending I know what that means, but I have no idea. So the the the, 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 the pigs that are shown at the fair <laughs> is strictly what we call phenotypical or our visual. An analysis. They look good. Yeah, they look. That, yeah. So we do all of this our analysis like the based on West the way Minster. they look. For dog, dog show, exactly. For <laughs> it has nothing to do big. with genetics. Right. It has nothing to do with yeah. how fast they grow, okay. how what kind of what kind of uh, quality right. pork they have, and all that. It's just literally how do they have a certain formation, a confirmation that that is um, right. appeasing to the judge. That day. So you got that line, and then you and have then you have your line. feeder pigs. So yeah. you got you basically got the, the ones that what I would eat. Right? Yeah, the, the yeah. ones that go to and and I and pretty much everything I sell goes directly to about four or five local farmers that then take them and, and feed them out and then they put on then they sell them through farmers markets. So mine's mine's literally pretty much everything I have is literally farm to table. I see. I don't go through any I don't sell at the stockyards and all that kind of stuff because I try to source everything local to get a get a higher price. Now do you use you use antibiotics equally across those two lines? Yeah, well they all because they all start off as everything's a feeder pig when it's born and then it works its way to the show line or, or divides itself off as they go through their after they've been weaned and all that right. kind of stuff. And so one year uh, we had a local food chain that moved in, and they were really sourcing a an antibiotic-free pork. And I'm like, and they couldn't source it. They were having heck trying to find pork that fit that. And I'm like, well, you know, I got all these pigs. I mean, I'm, maybe I'll try to source just for my local couple of um, couple of stores there, and so a couple of restaurants. And so I went to them. I said, hey, if I grow these and I run them through this operation and I don't use any antibiotics, will you buy them from me? They're mm -hmm. like, yeah. And so I started, it was a, Jan it was a January year, it's January litters, and everything was going great. I get them on the, I get them on the ground, and I, it was, sourcing the feed was a little bit difficult, too, for providing baby pig feed without it in there. But I found some without any antibiotics in it, and I fed them that. And it's January, and I don't have a, a nice, comfy place for mine. Mine are, on, I'm, a, I'm, a, you know, I'm on dirt and all that kind of stuff. And so it's cold, and it's warm during the day and cold at night. And I absolutely got nailed with scour problems. And it was just like that. And I mean, within 24 hours, I had 50% death loss. And it was, it took me those January litters to say, this isn't going to work. This mm. economically is not going to work, but I can't stand to see, to lose pigs. I mean, mm. it's just, it's absolutely one of those things where I don't have a lot of them, and so they become pretty, you know, every one of our sows have names, and, you know, they all, and, you know, they're owned by my kids, and so when they have babies, you know, they, they, they get attached, and so when it hit, when it hit them, and, you know, and you're, and you're inject, you know, the vet says, give them this, and give them that, and you, this oral, and this, and you save half of them, and you know, I'm just like, this makes no sense. Mm -hmm. I could have saved all of them if I'd just done my normal protocol and done it for the little two or three weeks. Instead, I lost half of them. And I just, I haven't done it since. Christine? And, yeah, and I think Kobe's example is exactly what we hear all the time. This is why prevention is important. If we don't prevent those diseases, you're going to lose 50%. So what would be the strategy? Vaccines? Um, so actually, what, I mean, get, get, tell us in, in nuts and bolts what prevention means. 
Prevention means you have identified animals that are at risk of getting a particular disease or illness, and you try to prevent it. So prevention use in antibiotics basically means you're, you're treating them with antibiotics, true, at a lower dose, to prevent having to treat them later on with an injectable antibiotic that can be a thousand times the same dose. Um, it can be a much stronger drug, more important to human medicine, and the animal might still not make it. Mm. Susan, your thoughts on this, on the kind of, you know, question, because I know you're worried about non-therapeutic uses, growth uses, et cetera. But in this, in this particular case, how would you, given your, I know you're really deployed in this area, but how would you set an alternative frame? Well, I think what you mentioned with vaccines, I think if you take a page out of Tyson's book and see how they're doing it with their producers that are um, being raised without um, the routine use of antibiotics um, and without, you know, having an antibiotic-free line, um, there are things that you can do husbandry-wise. There are things that you can do um, with other alternatives, and uh, probiotics, mm -hmm. um, competitive um, exclusion. There, there are other things that can be done um, besides using antibiotics as the first course and as the first, um, you know, al alternative. I think that we have to find alternatives. Um, consumers have a really tough time understanding why, you know why animals are sick, why, why you're raising animals in a husbandry way that has them sick, that you have to have antibiotics as part of that equation. I want to go to the audience, but just, just really quick answer from you guys. I am interested in data. I mean, I think data, and we're sort of in a data revolution. Uh, and, and when I get into different <laughs> sectors on data, one of the first things is, are we getting the data we want? Is it structured in the right way? Are you, are you basically getting an, an accounting of things that has... <laughs> consistency across the field. Has all that been figured out by someone? Is Tyson setting the standard on data? Is Colby setting? Are, are you setting the standard on data? How does the data picture look real quickly? Um, I think I think data is essential. Um, I think that the more companies can be transparent with their uses, I think the more drug companies can be transparent as well as But is there a framework companies? for data that you're comfortable with? Uh, uh, I think open I mean, data access. data is nothing unless yeah. you're looking at in, into the framework and Yeah, I think, I think the, the how, when, where, and why. Uh -huh. So if you look at an antibiotic drug class that's right. important in human medicine, knowing why it was used in food animal production, knowing when, when it was used and right. where it was used, and so knowing whether it's in feed, water, right. injection, and, and what the disease that it was treating was for. Christine? Yeah, you heard the last panel. We don't have anything on the agricultural side like they talked about on the human side. Right. So um, I think that's one of the challenges. As you indicated, data is meaningless unless you have the correct information. So, um, you know, we would support uh, systems that could collect data, maybe more research for or more funding for research and things like that. Um, we're on the tip of the iceberg and we need to better understand. Christine? I kind of take exception to this um, <clears throat> thought process that there's a lack of transparency, because in my mind, I was trying to think about it, and I don't really think that there's a lack of transparency. It's probably a lack of simplicity. Mm -hmm. I mean, things are so complex that it's very difficult to, to see everything all at once. And I was thinking about it kind of like how my office is. I have a wall-to-wall -wall window, which I'm very pleased that I have that kind of office space. And you can look in that window and you can see what's going on. Um, certainly, it's, it's transparent, right? But if you really want to see what's going on, you're going to have to walk through the front door, go up the elevator, come in, walk down the hall, go past the admin desk, and then stand in my doorway. Will you get the same view? Probably pretty darn similar. It's just a lot harder to get there. Hmm. I don't think either is more transparent than the other. And Colby, as a, as a family farmer, say you were brand new at this, what sorts of data coming from others would be useful to you as you sort of, sort of, I know I'm going to move to questions my folks are telling me, but, but just, I mean, I'm intrigued by, man, I want to go start a pig farm, I think. Well, but I mean, what, what, what should I need to know? I, th I think the, the most important thing is you, you have, you've got to have two essential relationships. One is with your feed dealer, feed manufacturer, because the nutrition is absolutely critical. If you have mm -hmm. poor nutrition, you're going to have poor health. And then number two is you, is you do need to have a very, very close relationship with a veterinarian because you don't know everything. You don't know the pathologies of things. You don't know what caused that animal to get sick. And if you have that relationship, and so if I have to say anything that's come out of the, these two guidances that's come out mm. is it's bringing, it's forcing farmers to utilize their experts that they have at will. 
And I so I do, I, I really do like that. I think the transparency thing is, is a little bit elusive. I think mm-hmm. that when you start to talk about a transparency, farmers want to say, Hey, I don't want to give you my stuff because you target me every time. So if we would continue to, if we continue to get targeted by giving you information, you take, you take, a, you take, you know, this and then turn it into this big mass of information, then how do we, how do we say, Hey, well, yeah, just come in, check everything. You know, it's hard. I have to tell you, if I start a pig farm, I'm probably not going to send mine off. I just don't think I could do that. I'm just going <laughs> to keep them and name them and have them around. Uh, let me open up to the floor. Comments and questions. Yes, right here in the front. I'm Jessica Hulse. I'm actually with Fresh Farm. We run farmers markets in D.C., Maryland, oh, and Virginia. Cool. So, Colby, I'm just wondering, in terms of the new regulations, you were talking about your relationship, this you know, the evolving relationship with your vet. What is that going to do to your costs raising the pig, and what is that going to translate to in terms of pork prices coming down to local consumers? Well, I mean, if I that's that's a question that a lot of us have. That we're we're really asking the same thing because uh, it cost me forty dollars to have my veterinarian come to my farm just just for him to show up and in his office is literally I can see it from my house <laughs> so so he literally I'm right there on his place but it's a st- it's a farm call and so it's forty dollars right off the bat uh, and then if I need any kind of thing like a health paper a VFD or anything like this and which I'm going to have to have I'm already out that cost and so depending on how this thing is designed for the small producers. We got to remember that 80% of the food, animal food production is grown by 20% of the farmers and 80% of the farmers grow 20% of the food. I fall in at 80%. So these VFDs were designed for the 20% that produce 80 because mm-hmm. they're the ones that produce for the masses. Of, so for of Tyson's. Us. Yeah, for the yeah. Tyson's, for the, for the Smithfields, for the Purdue's, for the, the whole group in this area. And, um, so the little guy is kind of the unintended consequence. So we're trying to still, we're still saying, hey, you know, feed mill, make sure we've got this thing set up that if you're getting a product from Elanco, how am I going to get it? Am I going to get it in a bag form? Am I going to have to start taking three tons of feed at a time? Am I going to be able to buy it by the bag because I only need five bags a year? So and short so- answer is costs go up. Costs will most likely go up. Well, my costs will go up. Will you pay more? I don't know. I will pay more so that your costs stay about the same. Good. And I think our shoppers will be down with that too. I hope. <laughs> That's interesting. How much, I mean, it's a really, you know, if you think you're, how much literacy is there out there about these questions publicly? I mean, I know we've got a fantastic showing this morning on a on on the on the Metro Disaster Day that shows that people, <laughs> but I, I didn't know that much about these, you know, this drama in, in the health world. But Christine, what is your sense among, out there among the vets in your area and, and sort of talking to the public. Is there, is there a literacy challenge out there about educating consumers? And Definitely. And as I was saying before, I don't think it's a lack of transparency issue. It's a lack of simplicity. And even amongst our own veterinarians, hmm. um, the AVMA represents a large percentage of the veterinary population. And so we have very diverse views. We have a very diverse membership. We have everybody from, um, you know, academia to companion animal practice to food animal practice, and we represent all sectors. And so it's all very different, and the levels of understanding are are very um, broad. Great. Other comments, questions? In the very back. Uh, Yes, my name is uh, Jamie Moore. I'm with uh, uh, Eaton Park Hospitality Group out of Pittsburgh. Uh, Just got a question in regards to the transparency in regards to the feeder hogs that Colby's raising that are going to another farmer. How transparent is it in regards to the antibiotics that maybe you're using that's passed off to the uh, folks that are uh, raising it out? Uh, That's a great question. Um, One thing that that I focus on is I vaccinate. Um, at, at three weeks and six weeks, and then I use and then I, I use that very limited source. And so everybody that buys a pig from me knows exactly what that animal has had and because it, it, you come exactly back to the transparent. When you get away from third-party involvements where, you, where you're growing for one and it's going to Tyson's and then Tyson's is going to this and then it ends up in the grocery store, the chain of command is broken. I'm not that way. I, my chain of command is I go, I go to the fair and I watch the kids show the pig or I go or I go and I watch them go to a farmer's market, whether it be fresh farms down here or around the, the um, 
So how characteristic are you of this concern? Uh, it's very. I mean, I, I tried. I tried to go the other way c- yeah. c- because you know the market. The, the market is pushing that way. I mean, we're we're seeing the poultry industry move to a disease treatment versus a disease prevention. That's how they can create this um, this no antibiotics forever mode. And it's easier in poultry mm-hmm. because they're grown in a they're they're hatched and then they go from the hatchery to the to the to the farm and then from the farm to the processing in about seven to eight weeks. And so the likelihood of them getting sick is a little is a little different than a pig. A pig's got a longer lifespan and, and is under a, a little different uh, version as well. And we didn't talk about cattle at all, but cattle the same way. You have cattle. We distribute beef, a lot of beef. We don't own any cattle. Most of don't own own cattle. Well, I'll get some cattle, folks, in the next <laughs> in the next session. Uh, are there are other questions, comments? Yes, right here in the front. Just a quick clarification. Yeah, we're going to bring you a mic so that we're, people are just hearing us mouth. On the, on the video here. Right. Uh, yeah. This is uh, for uh, Christine Doherty. You said uh, you're going to take antibiotics out that are, quote, important for human health. Is that by chemical class, by mechanism of action, or by cross resistance? Um, so basically, we had made the decision um, those antibiotics that are used in human medicine, and as Christine, there's medically important, critically important, there's different classifications. Um, and so uh, those items we will remove, such as a penicillin. Does that answer your question? But other beta-lactams would not be removed? No, no, that, that's a different, I mean, so in poultry, you, you have you, you have things such as uh, ionophores or those animal-only ones. Those are still used, mm. but those those ones that are used in human medicines are removed. There's a great list on FDA's website of what's considered medically important and not um, by the drug compound. So it's by class, and not by. It's by drug compound, and yeah. Susan, just to close up, five years from now, if we do this forum again, what will you have liked to have seen us accomplished that would satisfy your group's objectives? Wow. Um, I'd like to see uh, that the data that we're talking about collecting now. Um, a little had, bit louder. I, I would like to see that the data that we're collecting now has really helped us answer and solve um, where and when and why um, antibiotic resistant bacteria evolve in our food supply so that we can address those issues and not just in the United States but not internationally as well. If we want to be a, a trading partner to other countries, if we want to accept um, food from other countries, we have to have standards that exist not just here but everywhere. And we all have to be good stewards of antibiotics. And if we're not there, we're going to have a bigger crisis on our hands than we do now. Big round of applause. Please, please thank Christine Doherty, Colby Ferguson, Susan Vaughn Bruders, and Christine Wong. Thank you very much for a great discussion. Great. I thank you visit. so much again, Christine, Susan, Colby, Christine, and Steve. And-